Thanks, George. Thanks, worship team. Good morning, Harvest. Good to see you today. Be reaching for your Bibles, paper ones, electronic ones, not fussy, just as long as you have a copy of the Word of God in front of you. And we're going to be in Revelation. I'm going to reposition this, Revelation uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 7 uh, today. Now, the first thing that uh, I want to say uh, should, should not be controversial. It should not be controversial. However, I get that some people might be upset uh, by what I'm going to say. Uh, here it is. There are some truly great churches in the world. That's not the controversial part. There are some truly great churches in the world, and there are many terrible ones. Uh, but there are churches that are getting together today, uh, and I'm talking about local churches. There are churches that are getting together today that are hitting it out of the park every time they step up to the plate. And there are churches that should be shut down, torn down, and forgotten. Now, probably the majority of churches land somewhere between really great and really awful. The majority of churches land somewhere in between those two. Harvest lands somewhere between uh, those two. And I can say that not on the basis of my own experience, what I've observed in churches in the years that I've been pastoring, the people that I know, the churches that I know. I don't say it on the basis of my observations or opinion. I say it on the basis of our study in Revelation, which takes us now to two chapters where we have seven letters that were written to seven real local churches in Western Turkey in the first century. These seven letters, together with the overall vision, what we've already seen in chapter one, what we'll see in chapters four through 22, all of that was packaged together, given to the apostle John, and then sent out to these seven churches and then included in the New Testament so that we're studying it here today. And so as we look at these seven churches and we want to bridge the gap from that time, that culture, that language, 1900 years down to today, as we study these letters, so that we can see that the warnings that are given in these letters and the encouragements that are given in these letters and the promises that are given in these letters, those apply to us as well. Because in these letters, positive and negatives that we see in these letters, they apply to the church today as readily as they applied to the church in the first century. In these seven letters, we see the same issue that you and I are dealing with in the church. And in this first letter, the letter to the Ephesians, we're going to examine the biggest one right out of the gate, this matter of love. It's the cardinal virtue that's given to the church. It is the first commandment, as we'll see later. And the Ephesian church was doing a lot of things right. When we read the text, you're going to see they were doing a lot of things right. But according to Jesus, they had abandoned the love they had at first. And Jesus called it out. And if it is at all an issue here at Harvest, the Holy Spirit is going to call it out in us today too. He's going to call us out. And so let's turn our attention to the, to the scriptures. This is Revelation 2, 1 to 7. Uh, this is the letter to the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work, the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
Here's what we're going after in this. It's in your notes. It's on the screen. Jesus is in the midst of his church. We see that in the text. And so we must love as we first loved. Now, before we get into it and look at the points here, uh, the letters all actually follow a pattern. So as we look at this first one, it kind of sets up some of what we're going to see uh, through the next uh, six letters as well. And if you um, are uh, interested in this, you can go to the notes at hbc.info. You'll see the sermon notes there. There's a resource that I put together this week, which has kind of all of the items in the pattern, all the patterns that are in the letters, and then uh, where it fits with each of the letters. So it's a great resource for breaking down all of this and seeing how it was delivered to us. We start here in chapter 2, verse 1, with this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. We talked last week about uh, the angel. And um, these are the words of him. Notice now this description of Jesus that we get. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The seven stars, according to chapter 1, verse 20, are the angels of these churches. And so they're in the hands of Jesus, in his right hand. And Jesus walks, we're told, among the seven golden lampstands. The original vision, John turned and he saw Jesus standing among the lampstands. Now he's walking among these lampstands. He's engaged in the life of his church. He's involved with what's happening. He's aware of what's going on. Uh, Jesus is far from passive with respect to the churches. He's in the midst of his church. And the implication for us is that Jesus is in the midst of this church. Jesus is in the midst of our church as we gather here today. And so what comes next in the letter, this understanding of who Jesus is and that he's right here. The folks in Ephesus would have received this letter and Jesus is right here. So the implication then that flows from this, Jesus is in the midst of his church. And so we must love as we first loved. We'll do that. Let's start with this. We'll do that by building on the good that is happening. You'd be hard-pressed to find a local church that's all bad. Um, every local church has like something in it, we would presume, something in it that's, that's good. There's at least something there. Even, even when a church abandons right theology, when they abandon orthodoxy, when they leave the things of the Bible, they're not biblical anymore. Even when they're not believing biblical things, very often these churches are very compassionate, very loving. One of the ways that we uh, try to describe our ministry here was, is by talking about um, the verticality of it and, and, and how it's also horizontal. We love God, we worship Him, that's the vertical part of things, but we love one another. And we could say about a church like this that maybe has abandoned right theology, <clears throat> but is very loving and very compassionate. We could say that that church has lost its verticality, but it's still very effective uh, in terms of its horizontal ministry. I'm not endorsing that, by the way. I'm not saying that's a good way to go. I'm just saying that even in the worst church, you might still be able to find something that's worth lauding or praising. In fact, in the seven letters, all but one of them, six of the seven, are noted for something good that's happening in the church. Even Laodicea, who receives no condem, comment, comment, commendation at all, even that church, Christ still holds out the hope of them turning. He still believes there's something there that could turn back to him, and he offers them some hope. Two are, are commended and receive no criticism whatsoever. Smyrna and Philadelphia, we'll look at them when we get to them. And so just based on, on this little bit of an analysis of these seven letters, we could say in a majority of cases, we're going to find something about a church, no matter how badly it might be struggling, something that is commendable. In fact, Jesus says here to the Ephesian church, and you saw it, verse 2, I know your works, and he talks about their toil, the word means hard, hard work. I mean, they were at the ministry. He talks about patient endurance twice. He talks about how they can't bear with those who are evil, but they're bearing up for his name's sake. 
says that they've tested those who come to town and say they're apostles and are teaching things that are wrong. And they, they're so tenacious, toiling so hard that they're able to discern that this is false teaching. He has a very specific thing in verse 6, in fact. By the way, in verse 5, he, he levels a, a crushing rebuke, which we saw. But then he loves this church in Ephesus so much that he comes back and says, yeah, I know I just said a hard thing to you, but I just want to reiterate that there's some really awesome things that are happening in your church, all those things I said before. And he just throws this in in verse 6. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We're not going to spend any time figuring out who they are because that's going to come up later again. And at the end of the day, when you see all the really positive things that he says about Ephesus, you realize this is an awesome description for any church. Here's the two primary characteristics, characteristics that come out about this church. The, one, they're solidly teaching the Bible. I mean, they get, the word, they get together, they have the Word of God open, they're teaching it, they're growing in it, and not only do they have such confidence in what they believe, they believe it and know it so strongly that when someone comes in and is teaching something false, they can figure it out. So they have this going on. This is a strength of this church. They're teaching the Bible, they're solid in that. Secondly, they're handling the pressure of opposition and persecution in a good and godly way. This is, by the way, a massive theme through the entire book of Revelation. And this might have been particularly hard in the, in the city of Ephesus. It was a principal city in the Roman Empire, one of three principal cities in the Roman Empire. Uh, Emperor Domitian, who was on the throne ruling the Roman Empire at that time and hated Christians, hated them, picked Ephesus as one of the cities where they would be the center for the, uh, for the, the cult of the emperor. And so they had a temple there. The temple there was actually larger than the Parthenon in Athens. It was massive. And so this was a big center for the worship of the emperor. Meanwhile, we have this little church with these little believers who are saying, no, 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 salvation is in Christ alone. They're preaching the gospel. You can imagine that the emperor and all those thousands of, of, uh, of, of temple staff were not super excited about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they were bearing up under the weight of that. They were handling that pressure really well. And Jesus commends them for both of these strengths that they had. But I think you'd agree with me, no church can be good at everything. No church can be good at everything. Sometimes, though, people demand that. I know not any of you would ever demand such a thing. But a lot of people demand that churches be great at everything. And rather than seeing the good in a church and having grace for the rest, sometimes people are a little ungracious and maybe sometimes send emails. Again, none of you, I get it, would ever do such a thing. Maybe we just hear it in the wind that people are unhappy about things. People expect that a church is going to be great at everything. One of the awesome things about being involved in a city like this one is there are multiple churches that are really excited about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's at the center. They do ministry in different ways. And different churches that do ministry in different ways but still have the gospel at the center can save different people. The people we're going to reach are not the people that some of the other churches in town are going to reach. And so... Different churches, different strengths, not all, none of us are perfect at all of it. And what I love most about reading these seven letters is how, how Jesus takes the time to commend. He takes the time to encourage the church and to say, you know what, you're getting a lot of things right. He takes the time to build them up and to notice the good things that are happening in the midst of the church. It wasn't really in the midst of it, but afterwards that we could see how God was working in our church at really what, what we would describe as the lowest point in our church's history. For those who don't know, we've been around for just almost 21 years, and, um, and we went through a very, very low point as a church when we were, I mean, we've had a couple of dips along the way, but this one was a big one, and it was very discouraging. We felt beaten down. So many people walked out the door in that season who were very angry and very upset. In fact, we lost, uh, we, we, uh, we believe we lost around 40 families in 2009 and 10 over a period of about 12 months. 
It was a very, very, it just dragged on month after month. And, and yet, in the midst of that, as, as awful as it felt here, as terrible as that season was, I mean, the church is the Lord. And Jesus, we just heard, Jesus walks in the midst of his church, even when it's difficult, even when it's hard, even when it's awful, even when people don't want to be here. And in the midst of that season, even though we felt like it was horrible, people got saved and baptized. We did baptisms that year. People came, they became members of the church, they joined small groups, they still went to their small groups, they were studying the Bible week by week. Children were still being taught, youth were still being taught, marriages were still being counseled and put back together. In the midst of what was a terrible season for our church, God was still at work. And there were still good things that could be noticed in the midst of what we were going through. Whatever critique we're facing from the Lord, and we need to hear those critiques. We really do. We know it's built upon the good that's happening here because Jesus is in the midst of his church even when it's struggling. And good things happen when Jesus is around, amen? Good things happen when Jesus is around. Not, not because of us, but because he's around, because he's here doing that. So let's, that's the good stuff. That gets noticed. But notice also that we must be repenting of what's not so good. We're going to build on the good things that are here, but we need to be repenting of what's not so good. Now, I want you to imagine that you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. You get this like special moment where it's just you and Jesus, not in prayer, but face-to-face. -face. You're just sitting down and talking. Can you imagine how special that would be, how incredible that would be? And, and if Jesus took a few moments just to say, like, I just really love this about how you're living your Christian life, and I love what I see in you in this, and he just starts esteeming you, and then there's a little pause, a little quiet in the conversation, you each take a sip of your coffee, and then, and then he says, but. I mean, how deflated would you be at that moment, or mm, terrified, that Jesus was now about to point out something in your life that wasn't awesome. This is what he says in verse 4 now, after praising them, all the good stuff, verse 4, but I have this against you. I don't want to ever have anything that Jesus is against. But, notwithstanding the fact that this is from the Savior of the world, receiving critique is a good thing. If you've been to any leadership seminars, any workplace, uh, you know, teaching uh, sessions where they're telling you about how to develop as a person or how to develop as an employee or how to be a good leader, receiving critiques a good thing, knowing what we have to work on is absolutely essential to growth as human beings, as leaders, as workers. And of course, we understand no one is perfect. Do we all acknowledge that? Just nod your head right now if you acknowledge that you are not a per perfect person. Just nod your head. I'll wait until you all nod. No one is perfect. We all have work to do. In fact, I, I love this verse because it, it puts it all into perspective here. Hebrews 12, 6. We're understanding our relationship with God now. Hebrews 12, 6 says this, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Every Christian gets disciplined. It's not all just blessing from God. There are times when, it, you know, the path that we're walking, this the path of faithfulness and holiness, and we start to wander off the path. We're deviating to one side or the other. And sometimes God just tries to gently kind of move us back. And sometimes he needs to whoop us. A push, a shove. A, God needs to get us back on the path. He disciplines us because he loves us and he knows it's only pain and hurt when we get off the path. God just doesn't deliver blessing to us. He's intent on disciplining us. He chastises every son whom he receives. We always make a big deal when we come to son to make sure that everyone understands that it's both men and women being referred to there. Women, you can't, you can't claim that when it's the receiving a blessing and then say, oh no, that just says sons. This is sons and daughters. The, the, the Greek word is sons and daughters, children. 
every one of us, gets chastised because he's received us and he wants us to grow. And the very fact that Jesus is taking the time to write these letters communicates not harshness, but his love for the church. Far from being condemnation, Jesus' purpose in, in saying these things is, is, is greater holiness. It's, it's so that we might be, as individual Christians and also as churches, that we might be more like him. That's a name we should all have. All right, that's the setup. Here's, here's the actual critique. So the critique is that you have, he says to the Ephesian church, you got all these awesome things happening, but you have abandoned the love you had at first. Solid Bible teaching, steadfastness and endurance in the face of opposition. You have those things going on, but you are not loving in the way you were once loving. This, by the way, is consistent. This isn't the only church that struggled with this. Because Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and, and this is a very familiar chapter, but you're mostly familiar with verses 4 through 7, and you're not super familiar with the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13. It's a love chapter. But the love chapter really isn't about love. The love chapter is really about spiritual gifts and their use in the church. The first three verses, here's what it says. It's up on the screen. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, if I have these miraculous gifts, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, again, a very miraculous gift, if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that, so that I could remove mountains, that's a powerful gift. But Paul says, but have not love? I am nothing. If I give away all I have, less miraculous or maybe more miraculous, I don't know, but you give away all of your wealth, everything that you own, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, even if I become a martyr for the thing that I believe, give my own life for it, but have not love, I gain, what's the word? Nothing. Well, that's startling. But that's exactly what he's saying to the Ephesians here in Revelation 2. You have the solid Bible teaching. It's awesome. You're enduring under the opposition. Also awesome, but you have not love. So it actually, God is counting it now as zero. It's zero. What Paul cautions the Corinthians about was a problem in Ephesus. And I think we could say a problem today. This is a challenge that we're all facing. Now, it wasn't that the Ephesian believers were always this way. In fact, if you think about the way it's stated here by Jesus, the love you had at first, the love you had at, at first. Now, this could be appealing to the people themselves and saying, do you remember when you were first converted, when you first became a Christian and the passion you had, you... You couldn't get enough of the Bible. You couldn't get enough of worship. You wanted to be with God's people all the time. You, you were just so moved by your own salvation, the forgiveness of your sins. You just had all this passion right out of the gate when you were first converted. Could be that. Or it could be, in fact, Ephesian church, I want you to think about what it was like when you were founded. The resurrection happened in the mid-30s AD. This is now the mid-90s, 60 years later. The church was established sometime in the, in the, in the 50s, I, I believe, mid-50s. So we're talking about a 40-year gap from the time that the gospel first came to Ephesus and the first conver converts were there. 40 years later now, this letter is being written to that very same church. So you, now you have second or even possibly third generation Christians in that, in that church. And so what Jesus may be saying is, I need you to think about 
what it was like when your parents and grandparents started this church and first heard the gospel and how they loved God, how love manifested in the church in those days. That's the love you had at first. And so for all of us, we need to think about that. What was it like when I was first saved? What was it like when the church was first planted? These are the things that we need to get back to to assess the love that we had at that time. And I can't help but think of, it's going to sound a little strange at first, but I can't help but think of, when I read this phrase, the dating, engagement, marriage relationship. Because it, it, it's, it, we're saying the same thing. How many marriages come for counseling all these years later and the complaint is, he doesn't love me like he used to. When we were dating, dot, dot, dot. And the counselor has to help unpack all of that. And it's such an appropriate illustration because the Bible often describes the relationship between humanity and God in terms of the marriage relationship. In fact, go back to the Old Testament, the book of Hosea is all about that. Or throughout the Old Testament, Whenever the nation of Israel went after other small g gods and set up other idols and set up places to worship that wasn't about Yahweh, it was always described as adultery. It was described as adultery because God saw the relationship in that manner. Jump to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writing to these same Ephesian believers in his letter in chapter 5 talks about the, the husband-wife relationship, mutual submission that happens in that relationship, and he compares it to the relationship between Christ and the church. In fact, marriage is a picture of that relationship between Christ and the church. And then in this book, in the book of Revelation, what we're really heading toward, we're in chapter two right now, we're gonna work through these seven letters, we're gonna get into these incredible images of what's going on in heaven, the worship in heaven in chapters four and five, chapter six, through 19, as we cruise through all these incredible visions that John has, we get to chapter 19, you know what happens? Something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. This whole thing, all these visions, everything we're going to read, everything we're living out right now, it's all heading us toward this wedding banquet. And listen, we're the bride. We're going to our own wedding. And the bridegroom is Christ himself. So the image is perfect, it's appropriate for us to think about it in this way. So when Jesus says here, you have abandoned the love you had at first, he's wanting us, those of us who have been in these kinds of relationships, he wants us to think about the dating, engagement, marriage relationship. Because when you first start out, Cheryl and I have been married... Um, 32 years. I wasn't faking that. 32 years. When you first start out, there's all this attention given to the relationship. Back in, so we were dating back in the mid 80s. And um, like, I just remember times when we would get together. This is like pre cell phone days, so you were never distracted, right? It wasn't like every conversation is distracted by the phone. There were no texts coming in, no emails coming in, no, no web to surf. So we were just, we got together, like four-hour conversations, four hours. I mean, Cheryl and I don't do anything for four hours together that isn't interrupted by several episodes of something on HGTV. Four hours. Well, that's because we wanted to be together and we wanted to talk and I wanted to hear all about her life and I wanted to find out things about her and she wanted to find out things about me and she talked and she doesn't talk very much and she talked and I probably talked more than she talked. Did you say probably? That's fair. We love that time together. Four hours. Now, like I'm in mean, my life now, a four minute phone call for me is too long. If, if, and that's, the staff all know this. If I, I don't like long meetings, so meetings have to be short. I, I just don't like doing that kind of stuff. 
But back in the day, I could spend all that time just talking to one person and not feel like any time at all had passed. We spent time together. We gave gifts to one another. Would have done anything for the other. Served them. We showed affection to one another. Words were spoken that were affirming and loving. I love you. I love spending time with you. You're the best thing that has ever happened to me. That's the love we had at first. And if you get 32 years down the road and you look back and you go, it's just not like it was then. And in some ways it won't be, and that's fine. It's 32 years later. But the love should still be there. And if you notice 32 years later that you don't have that love, that it's waning, that it's gone, then you go back to the beginning. Get that back. Restore that. That's the bonus application because this is not a sermon about marriage. But there's an application there. There's a lesson there for all of us who are in marriages and have been in marriages for a while. Go back to the beginning. Restore the thing you had at first. And that's what Jesus is saying to the Ephesian church. Their relationship was quite loving in the early days, but it had now become cold and distant and mechanical. And Jesus wants more for the relationship because Jesus gave his all for the relationship. Romans 5.8, God shows or demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus went to the cross for us, for the relationship. Jesus demonstrated his love from the beginning and all throughout the entire relationship and to this day is still pouring out that love on all of us. No matter how many years we walk with him. We need to model that back in our love for him and in our love for others. In fact, there's a lot of discussion here, having just said that, there's a lot of discussion here in the commentaries about whether Jesus is talking about love for him, the, church, the church's love for God, or if it's the church's love for others, for people. But it is, in fact, a moot point. The two Two aspects of love, love for God, love for people. Those things are inseparable for the Christian. You can't love God, love God, and hate your brother, 1 John 4.20 says. Our love for others flows from our love for God. The two are inseparable. We love God, we love people. In fact, that's the great commandment, the first and second commandments that are given to us in Matthew 22. We're going to love God. We're going to love people. And so it's a very healthy exercise for us to be asking ourselves if our love for God and if our love for people is in any way growing cold, mechanical, or distant. Here's what we're really asking. Is our motivation for what we do something other than love? Because we're doing a lot of things as a church. The church in Ephesus was doing a lot of things in ministry. But what was motivating it? Is, it? is it Bible teaching for the sake of Bible teaching? Is it, is it ministry for the sake of ministry? Is it, is it the institution for the sake of the institution? Is it tradition for the sake of tradition? Are these the things that are motivating us? By the way, nothing wrong with tradition, nothing wrong with the institution. God established it. Obviously, nothing wrong with Bible teaching, nothing wrong with ministry. These are given to us by God. Nothing wrong with any four of those things, but they don't exist for themselves. They can't possibly be our motivation. Our compelling motivation has to be love. We have to be driven by this commandment to love God and love people. Now, churches that get this wrong include those, just as an example now, include those that prioritize the preservation of the institution. I'm talking about a local church or even a denomination. The preservation of the institution above all things. We must continue to exist as a church 
because we have always existed or we have existed for X number of years. Our history and traditions are more important than change and more important than reaching people. That church has lost the narrative. It's lost its way. We don't prioritize the institution above all things. That's an entrenched attitude. It's really an intransigence. And it's as common today in many churches and many church traditions, it's as common today as COVID. And it is a disease that could be eliminated by returning to the love that they had at first. In fact, among a younger generation, there's a deep suspicion of institutions. There's a good reason for that, and they're not all wrong in that generation to put institutions on trial. In fact, I would say they're not at all wrong to put institutions on trial. Jesus is putting institutions on trial in, the, in, in Revelation 2 and 3. The failure of that generation is, is the blanket statement that all institutions are wrong. That's the failure. God has established institutions, and institutions that prioritize love for God and love for people should be belonged to and engaged with. But we certainly don't just perpetuate an institution because it's just always been here. That's a fallacy. Some churches need to die. The remedy here is threefold. Verse 5, remember, repent, and do. Remember from where you've fallen. Go back and read the history book. Pull out the albums. Look at the pictures. Talk to people who were there. Find out what it was like at the start. Rehearse and review the history. Remind yourself of what it was like. Remember, repent, agree with God. Repentance is two things. First, it's agreement with God. God, I'm dropping all my excuses and all my explanations. I'm not deflecting to anyone else anymore. I'm taking responsibility. I, repentance is this, I agree with you. That's the start of repentance is I agree with God. We've strayed. We're not as loving as we once were. I'm acknowledging our failure. I'm not providing any reasons or excuses for it. I'm just owning it. And then do, and this is really the second part of repentance. It's, it's, it's agree with God and turn. And so the, the turning is part of this doing. Do the works you did at first. Turn back to a loving God. Turn back to loving God and loving others. Now, I thought it would be helpful right here just to insert a little definition of love, so we understand what we're talking about. And this is from C.S. Lewis. It's in a, um, a Q&A that he did back in 1944, and he just said this in answering a question. He said, love is not affectionate feeling. Now, sometimes love includes affectionate feelings. We need to hear what Lewis is saying here. Sometimes it includes affectionate feelings, but he's making the point that it's not based on that. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a, I love this phrase, a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. A steady wish for the loved person's, the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. And that fits again as we go back to the dating engagement marriage illustration. That fits perfectly. That I'm I'm going to have this steady wish for Cheryl's ultimate good as far as that can be obtained. She's going to have a steady wish for my ultimate good as far as that can be obtained. And I'm going to work to try and obtain that. And she's going to work to obtain that. We can do that in the church. You can do it in your small groups. You can do it in your families. You can do it in your friendships. You can do it with unbelievers. And you can do it with God that you could have a steady wish for God's ultimate good as far as that can be obtained in any way that you could possibly make that happen. And so do we, 
in every case, despite challenges, despite any return that we might receive for having loved someone, despite the cost to us, do we have a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good? So much more I could say about all of that, but that was a very long point. That's why the last point is very short, but we're not there yet. We have one more to go, and then the last one. You still with me? Everybody still with me? All right. It's evident from that last point that we must be heeding the divine warnings. Now, we kind of got the warning built in there, but, or at least we got the critique, and now we get this warning. And I agree that we mere humans should be cautious about critiquing other churches, and the safest thing that we can do in this series is to read these letters and think only about what Jesus is saying to harvest. That's the safest thing to do. That's the right thing to do, and not to be thinking about how this applies to anyone else. And I say that because leading a church is hard. I've been, I've been leading this church together with the elders and our staff. I've been leading this church for 21 years. Leading a church is hard, right, Clem? Leading a church is hard. It's hard because the world doesn't want the church to succeed. It's hard because, as we'll see repeatedly in the book of Revelation, there is spiritual warfare. There is an unseen spiritual warfare going on, even in this moment, as I'm proclaiming the Scriptures to you, the, the evil one and his minions are working overtime to have you not believe, to have you distracted. There's a spiritual warfare. So it's hard because this is a spiritual warfare. And it's hard because leaders are flawed. I'm flawed. Our elders are flawed. Our staff is flawed. We have flawed leaders here. Every church has flawed leaders. And it's hard because people, you, are difficult to lead. You can own that? Difficult to lead. So it's hard here at Harvest. It's hard at Emmanuel. It's hard at Connexus. It's hard at Maple View. It's hard at South Shore. It's hard at Bethel. It's hard at Willow. It's hard at every local church that is meeting today all over this planet. We need to have more grace for each other, amen? More, more grace for each other. We don't need to critique each other, but, but, th but then again, when Jesus brings the critique, would you agree that it, we should sit up and, and heed that critique and listen to Jesus? Here's what Jesus says to the Ephesian church. Now, keep in mind what this church is. This is a principal city in the Roman Empire. Paul had spent more than two years there. Timothy was the lead pastor of that church. They had as many as five letters that we have in the New Testament that were written to them. We have the letter to the Ephesians. First and second Timothy were written to Timothy while he was the pastor of that church. They were written to him, but written for the church. Many scholars believe that first John, John was writing to address Gnosticism and that Ephesus was, uh, was the recipient of that letter. And then, of course, Revelation would have come to them. Five New Testament books would have been addressed specifically to them. This is a significant church. This isn't some podunk church in Barrie, Ontario. This is Ephesus. And Jesus says to them, if you don't remember, repent, and do. Here's what he says. Verse 5 continues. Look at it. I will come to you. No, not in that verse one kind of way where Jesus is walking in the midst of the churches, not in that kind of way, like Jesus is here right now walking in midst. No, this is like, I'm going to come to you, and when I come, I'm dropping the hammer. This is Jesus coming in discipline. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. He's not taking the light fixtures out of the church. The lampstand, remember from chapter 1, the lampstand is the church. Jesus is saying, I'm coming 
and I'm revoking your credentials as a church. You will no longer be a church. I'm taking that from you. If you don't get this right, you're not even going to be a church anymore. Oh, you may still have the sign out front. You may still have the building, the fancy website, the staff may still be holding services and running ministries. You may be doing all of that, but I just need you to know, I am not there. I'm no longer walking with you. You are a church in name only. Now, when that's the, when that's the consequence, we can't afford to not heed what Jesus is saying here. We have to open our ears. We have to shut down every other distraction. We have to lean in because Jesus says, verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Listen up. That's what verse 7, the first part of verse 7 is. Listen up. If you have ears, you better be listening. The stakes are immeasurably high. The consequences of not hearing him are devastating. And we should never be so self-assured in our ministry, so confident in what we're doing, so proud of what we have here. That we fail to heed the warnings that he may be delivering to us. I know plenty of examples of churches that failed to hear, heed the warnings. But this past week, I was speaking to the pastor to a pastor at Harvest Chicago. And for any of you who don't know the history, um, this church, in, in church planting uh, world, we talk about mother churches and daughter churches, and this church here in Barrie is a daughter church of Harvest in Chicago. 21 years ago, I was sent from that church, uh, went there for training, came here, planted this church with the group that was already here in Barrie, and we established Harvest Bible Chapel. We were the third church plant, and over the next 15, 16 years, 150 churches were part of our fellowship. It was incredible to be a part of all of that during that decade and a half. Decade and a half. But then, in 2017, our fellowship came to an end. There was a formal fellowship of churches. That ended in 2017, and it began a cascading. In fact, things started going off the rails in 2013 and really just culminated in 2017. And two years later, the founding pastor of Harvest in Chicago was terminated by the church. I'm not telling you anything that's any secret. All of this is uh, common knowledge. It's very public. It's very painful to re even really just rehearse. It was very, very messy, and a lot of people were hurt during that season. In fact, uh, for that church, that uh, church in Chicago, our mother church, uh, two-thirds of the church left between 2017 and, and, and really 2019, 2020. Two-thirds. It was a church at the time on multiple campuses in Chicago of between 12 and 13,000 people, and today it numbers around 4,000. They were disciplined hard. Jesus came to them. I will come to you. And Jesus came to them. Well, this week I was talking to one of the pastors there, and we're seeking to reestablish our relationship with our mother church uh, through this time. And it was good to, to talk to him. Uh, they have a lot of new leaders in place. They're recovering from the trauma of all of those years. They're learning the lessons and taking responsibility for their failures, and uh, they've, they've uh, repented. They've taken ownership, and it's, it's great to see the recovery happening and, and people who are going there now who have been away from the church for some time just saying, I just feel a freedom here, and that's awesome that the Spirit is moving again. But here's what this pastor said to me, and this is, this is why I'm telling you this story. This is what this pastor said to me. And he's been there, by the way, for 23 years on staff. He said, I was so filled with pride. Not the church. He, the church was too, but he was just talking about himself. He said, I was so filled with pride over what we had built. I believe we had the best church. And he said, God crucified that in me. And he also said that they had blown past, he personally had blown past all the warnings that were there. He said, I only see them now in retrospect, but we blew past all of the warnings that God was giving to us. 
again, so grateful that they're seeing healing through all of that, but the end result of that difficult season was devastating. And um, my, my, my heart for us is that we would just avoid that here by heeding the divine warnings now. Amen? Doesn't that sound like a better plan? It's a much better plan. All right, one final point, which I said was super fast and really is. Finally, let's be trusting the promise of eternal life. And we can spend a little bit of time on this one because we're going to keep coming back to this theme of promises being fulfilled. And in fact, the entire book of Revelation is about that. It's about a promise being refilled and the, uh, fulfilled and the, uh, the, 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 the triumph of our Savior and the redemptive plan coming together. And so uh, trusting the promise of eternal life, uh, you know, Here's the reward for hearing him. If we, if we lean in and hear him, verse 7 continues, to the one who conquers, to the one who gets it, to the one who hears me, to the one who, who loves as they first loved, to the one who repents, to the one who perseveres, to the one who keeps teaching the Bible while loving God and loving people, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The tree of life the very picture of fulfillment and satisfaction of having our hunger and thirst satisfied. Whatever else we might think will bring satisfaction or fulfillment, it won't. Only the tree of life will. This is the gospel. Christ provided everything for us, and the fulfilling of the promises is exactly what we're all looking for. And all we need to do is trust God for these promises. Trust Him for what is yet to come. And so that's it. Jesus is in the midst of His church. Let's love as we first loved. Amen? We're going to close in just a moment with um, a couple of songs, actually, uh, to close our time of worship as we reflect on, on all of this. And, you know, these letters, to a large extent, are about the simplicity the simplicity of loving God and getting back to something that we originally had. And we, we heard that already here in this letter to the um, Ephesians. And, and that can often be obscured by, obscured by all the things that we've talked about. And so all I'm going to say is we're, we've simplified things for the close here. The band isn't coming back up, just a couple of guys. We're just going to have vocals and, and we're just going to allow you to reflect you can sing if you want, you can worship, you can pray, you can kneel, you can stand, you can respond in any way you want. You can come up here to the, to the front and kneel and pray if you like. Just respond as we worship the Lord in the simplicity of who He is, unencumbered by all of the extras that we often put into place. So let me pray for us and then we'll worship. Father, thank you so much again. As I think about your kindness, I, I think about the kindness of you giving us your word and writing this letter to this church. Father, we believe that you've written this letter to us and we want to heed the warnings that are there and we want to see you work in a powerful way here. Father, we don't want to get in the way at all. Father, we want to recapture the simplicity of what it means to love you and serve you and have faith in you. And so God, as we take this time now to reflect on everything that we've heard, it's a lot. I pray, God, that you would move by your Holy Spirit to convince us of these truths to continue the work of transforming us into, your, into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Receive our worship now, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ.